the Milky Way. Shimamira too looked up, and he felt himself floating into the Milky Way. Its radiance was so near that it seemed to take him up into it. Was this the bright vastness the poet Basho saw when he wrote of the Milky Way arched over a stormy sea? The Milky Way came down just over there to wrap the night earth in its naked embrace. There was a terrible voluptuousness about it. Shimamura fancied that his own small shadow was being cast up against it from the earth. Each individual star stood apart from the rest, and even the particles of silver dust in the luminous clouds could be picked out. So clear was the night. The limitless depth of the Milky Way pulled his gaze up into it. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I'm continuing my journey through modern Japanese literature with Yasunari Kawabata's Snow Country. This is probably his most famous novel, but I first came to know of Kawabata because of the inspiration that William T. Volman took from Kawabata's Palm of the Hand stories for Volman's The Atlas which I still claim as the best place to start for Volman. As I said in my previous video of the modern Japanese novel Kokoro by Natsume Soseki, I'm going through a handful of these highly acclaimed modern Japanese novels that include Mishima, Soseki, Kawabata, Abe, Tanazaki, and many others. I've also been reading a short scholarly text to give me a framework for Japanese literature, and I'm soon to receive Donald Keene's great book on the pleasure, the beauty of Japanese literature, thanks to recommendations from all of you. This is the vintage paperback of Snow Country, and it's translated by Edward G. Seidensticker, who also spent a lot of time translating the tale of Genji and survived to tell of it for all of us in Genji days. A special thank you to one of my viewers who got in touch with me and told me about this in preparation for my upcoming reading of Tale of Genji. Unlike Kokoro, this is not an I novel, as it's called. This isn't from the first person point of view. This is the objective third, though we stay very closely with Shimamura, the privileged male who goes from Tokyo up to the snow country. That is the mountain resort where he spends time luxuriating in the presence of the geisha that they keep there. One geisha in particular, and that is Komako. It's third person limited. We stay with Shimamura. We sense, of course, and what will be felt by most modern readers is the inherent patriarchy that's in here. Without a groan or a blink of an eye, we're given this story nonchalantly about a married man with children who seems to just go whenever he feels like it up to get pleasure from the geisha in the mountain resort by himself and doesn't think anything of it, but yet, of course, condemns one of the geisha who does much the same thing. So, you know, we've got this double standard. I think that it's pretty blatant and it doesn't verge on the misogynistic. It's given to us more as verisimilitude of the time and place and culture. So anyhow, I'm learning a lot more about the geisha than I ever knew before because I've never really pushed myself to look into it. I sort of had an inkling of the geisha culture, but I didn't realize just how elaborate and far-reaching it is until Snow Country pushed me to start learning more about it because judging just from Snow Country, it seems very much like prostitution. And so along with Shimamura, it raised questions of the propriety of selling oneself as a geisha. I like the way he puts that, questions of the propriety of selling oneself, because it doesn't necessarily mean sex, as prostitution implies. Geisha quite literally sell themselves over to a geisha house. So there is a house and a person who owns them or has a contract with their body, mind, and spirit, basically. And the geisha are trained in all kinds of different performing arts, musicians, singers, poetry, and 
chiefly in the art of conversation because geisha one of the things that you would do with a geisha is to have them as a companion for going out to a party or you would have them installed at a party that you're throwing so that they can go around and do these different performances and conversations with the guests. And as this beautiful cover implies, with the geisha in the traditional hairstyle where it's all pulled up and sits like a bun on top of the head, and the elaborate kimono, and the obi, or the, the fastener, which you can't quite see here, and then the bright red lips, the signature white powdered face, and then you'll notice she's looking downward in this body language of submissiveness. And of course what happens is that Shimamura goes up there and he is drawn to Kamako. Kamako in turn is clearly drawn to him. And as time goes on, she gets more and more reckless. And by that I mean she starts to care less and less about being caught sneaking into this man's quarters all the time when she's already had her time purchased to be with other people. And so it is a big breach of contract. And this novel starts to read almost like a 20th century French novel in its light sensuousness, but the male and female characters constantly pushing and pulling, constantly ebbing and flowing against one another. Once things start to get too intimate, too close, things start to go awry. And the more that Shimamura finds out about Kamako, the more the double standard for women that comes out. The story in part two will raise a pitch when Kamako decides to sell herself as a full-on geisha, one of the main geisha of this mountain resort, which has incredibly low standards, as they say in the book, compared to other places. There's this whole uh, city life, which is resides in Tokyo, where Shimamura is from, versus the country life of the simple folk. But when she decides to buy a four-year contract at the age of 20, this really ruffles Shimamura's feathers. And he just can't understand why she would do such a thing, but it seems so clear to her. So there's a clash of lifestyles here, which of course is nothing new to literature. But when you throw in the element of the setting, the atmosphere, which is first and foremost in the title, Snow Country, because this is in snow-bounded mountains of Japan, this is where Kawabata shines because Kawabata beautifully executes the interplay between the landscape and the moods of the characters. Yes, the book is definitely Japanese in its origin. We've got, of course, the geisha culture. We've got the no theater makes a presence in here. The kabuki plays, rice sheaves and rice making. But the interplay of the landscape and female beauty as perceived through the eyes of Shimamura, who is clearly attracted to sadness, is what sets this book apart and made it unputdownable for me and raised my emotions, stirred my spirit as I read it. There are two images around which this is constructed. The first image comes very early on in the train car where Shimamura is looking out the train window and at the same time that he's seeing the mountains in the coming dark in the background beyond the window, it's also acting as a mirror and foregrounding a woman named Yoko. A little later on, he has this same moment where in his bedroom he looks to the window and he sees the brilliance of this snowy mountain landscape beyond the window, but then the reflection of Kamako with these bright red cheeks because she has taken off her geisha powder. And these two images, this use of the window mirror, that's window hyphen mirror, beautifully communicates something to the reader about this intertwining of beauty and sadness for which Kawabata is known. 
We can tell from the way it's written that this meant a great deal to Kawabata. And it makes sense that even despite winning the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1968, in fact, Kawabata is the first Japanese to win the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1972, a mere four years later, he would take his own life without leaving behind any form of note. That light off in the mountains had passed across the girl's face in the train window and lighted her eye for a moment. The impression came back to Shimomura, and with it the memory of the mirror filled with snow and Kamako's red cheeks floating in the middle of it. The first notes opened a transparent emptiness deep in his entrails, and in the emptiness the sound of the samasan reverberated. He was startled, or better, he fell back as under a well-aimed blow, taken with a feeling almost of reverence, washed by waves of remorse, defenseless, quite deprived of strength. There was nothing for him to do but give himself up to the current, to the pleasure of being swept off wherever Kamako would take him. These two images, these two frozen moments in time with this incredible tableau, with the window mirror is summed up by the point at which he parted with reality. So these two moments for Shimamura become portals in his memory that he can use to escape time. This, of course, sets up for what I can only call a cosmic integration that wraps up this beautiful, piercing novel beautifully and piercingly. Snow Country is written in a very crisp, simple manner, but using the dynamics between a man and a woman who are in two totally different stations of life, the man being pretty much completely free and the woman being bounded literally by a contract, it still exposes so many complex emotions and states we find ourselves in this human life, just as much as the philosophical quandaries that we're presented with in Sosaki's Kokoro. Some of the writing achieves a near aphoristic bent. Illness shortens the distance between a man and a woman. When you don't drink, you don't know what it is to really enjoy yourself. And one that could clearly stand out as the question to take with you into the reading of the book. Only women are able really to love. Because in the end, Kamako risks her life not for a man, but for a woman. I found myself loving this book because I love books that are set in a time and place where there's no technology, no phones, no TV, and all the way until the end when we get the fire that's gonna provide the sort of ekporosis to close the novel. The fire is started by a film catching on fire and then people being notified via telephone. So I found, found that very ironic that it would be technology itself, which is so absent from the book, that would cause this fiery ending. Nonetheless, between the meaning of Kamako's putting her life at risk and that cosmic integration or transcendence that begins to happen on part of Shimamura, this book is anything but simple. So now between Kokoro and Snow Country, I am having a very pleasant time getting acquainted with modern Japanese novels. Next up, Mishima.